The Blue Jays offense has been on a rampage. So naturally, they were no hit. You are locked on MLB. Your daily MLB podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello, baseball fans, and welcome to Locked On MLB, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. This is the daily podcast. We talk about all the Major League Baseball. I am your host, Paul Francis Sullivan. There's my lower third. You can call me Sully. I'm an Emmy nominated television producer who has been a baseball podcaster for well over a decade now. This is my fifth full season here at the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm using a different computer today, so if my video looks a little different than normal there's something wrong with my laptop but the game must go on i'm dropping this on sunday the what is it is it the ninth day of july 2023 this is the last day before the all-star break hey swing for the fences on sleeper picks and you win up to 100 times your money download the sleeper app and use promo code locked on you'll get up to 100 dollar match on your first deposit terms and conditions apply See Sleeper's terms of use for details. Currently in operational in over 30 states. Check out Sleeper today. Hey, follow us at Lockdown MLB Pods on Twitter and Instagram. I'm your pal Sully. I'm at Sully Baseball on Twitter. Sully Baseball Podcast on Instagram. Let's get down to, we had a couple of people guess the trivia question correctly. It was, who was the only member of the 600 home run club? to have never won a league MVP. And surprise, surprise, uh, Craig Brindle and Amy Green, my su- my two trivia superstars, got it right. And the answer is Jim Tomey. Jim Tomey managed to join the 600 home run club. And I had to double check to see, wait, what about Mark McGuire? What about uh, Rafael Palmero? Aha, neither of them got to 600. And neither one of them won the league MVP. Neither did Jim Tomey who just was consistent year in and year out, and apparently uh, supposedly the nicest human being ever to play the game of baseball. So he never won the MVP. Sadly for Jim Tomey, he also never won a World Series. But he did win the hearts of fans. It did win a plaque at Cooperstown. And it is tough to argue with that. So I'd have you not hear that little cough I just did. Hey, uh, big, big game on Saturday and just goes to show you don't know where the big star is going to show up you know who the big star is going to be and if I went in and I said hey I have an idea I think I know who it's going to be I think it's going to be Matt Manning that's right Matt Manning of the Detroit Tigers I bet none of you put him on your sleeper pick to be you know he's going to throw take a no hitter into the seventh inning Well, that's exactly what happened against a team that going into this series against Detroit was on an absolute offensive rampage. The the Detroit Tigers, a pretty nondescript team that is nominally in the pennant race because the American League Central is a mess right now. But Matt Manning took the mound and took a no-hitter into the seventh inning, and A.J. Hinch relieved him, and the fans started booing A.J. Hinch as if A.J. Hinch showed up in L.A. If you don't know why, then you don't know your history of the 2017 World Series. But um, evidently, Matt Manning didn't know he was throwing a no-hitter. He said that in the uh, post-game interview. He said, uh, I had no idea. Um, <clears throat> Jason Foley and Alex Lang came up and combined. And you know what? I mean, look, at we all want to have the gutsy, you know, Bob Gibson, uh, Sandy Koufax, Nolan Ryan going up there and pitching all nine innings on their own. We all want that. And sometimes these combined no-hitters can feel a little weird. But do you know what? Good. You know, not all no-hitters are supposed to have the same feel. Not all no-hitters are supposed to bring about the same memories. And so, yeah, every once in a while, you get yourself a combined no-hitter. We had one in the World Series last year. Would it have been cool if Christian Javier pitched all nine innings and joined Don Larson? Sure. But do you know what? It was more important 
for the Astros to win that game. Today, who knows? Matt Manning continued to pitch deep into the ball game and you know started to lose it, and suddenly the Blue Jays' bats woke up. Do you know what? Maybe that would have been a bad situation and turned Matt Manning's wonderful outing into a loss. And lest we forget, the Blue Jays are still kind of sort of in this thing. They're one of the wild card teams, and they were a full game ahead of the New York Yankees. But here we go. When you start listing Tiger no-hitters, you're going to have people, you know, Jack Morris is going to be listed in there. Justin Verlander is going to be listed in there. Sure, but you know who's also going to be listed in there? Jason Foley, middle reliever. Alex Lang, closer on a nondescript team. Kind of like how Brian Abreu, Rafael Montero, and Ryan Presley are in the World Series record books for being part of that combined no-hitter. Oh, it's odd. Isn't it weird that Christian Javier has been involved in two uh, combined no-hitters in the same year? Once against the Yankees in regular season, once in the World Series. I digress. You know, the last, uh, the, the, the first real Mets no-hitter. Because all due respect to Johan Santana, who went nine and basically never pitched the same again. There was a potential Hall of Fame career derailed. Uh, we all know that if there was instant replay back then, one of those foul balls would have been one of the foul balls would have been called fair, and he would not have a uh, a no hitter in Mets history. Instead, Tyler McGill, Drew Smith, Jolie Rodriguez, Seth Lugo, and Edwin Diaz are in the record book for a Mets no hitter. Not Nolan Ryan, who threw his no hitter elsewhere, not Dwight Gooden, who threw his no-hitter elsewhere, not Tom Seaver, who threw his no-hitter elsewhere, not David Cohn, who threw his no-hitter elsewhere. All these former Mets threw their no-hitters on places other than the Mets. But lo and behold, Tyler McGill, Drew Smith, Jolie Rodriguez, Seth Lugo, and Edwin Diaz will inevitably be part of a trivia question I ask in five years. You know, and it's just, you know, it's, I personally find them to be kind of fun and goofy you get to see some people you know the the angels uh no hitter that was thrown in the wake of the death of tyler skaggs had had taylor cole throwing just the first couple innings i think it was an opener situation and then felix pena came in and finished the final seven innings that was an instance where the combined no hitter made it a little more poignant it was a team's tribute to uh, Tyler Skaggs, who had just died like 10 days before. And then it was the first home game. I, I, what, I mean, it was, it was, I, I forget, it was so close. It was like a week or maybe two weeks after the death of Tyler Skaggs. It was their first home game since he died. And it was a team no hitter. So you couldn't mention that no hitter without bringing up Tyler Skaggs and bringing up the fact that it was a combined situation to honor him. You know, you had that weird one that was in, I think, was it in Mexico City when there were Walker Bueller and a bunch of the uh, Dodgers combined for one in, in bad, you know, in bad circumstances. My favorite one of them, my favorite combined no-hitter of all was uh, in 2003 when Roy Oswalt of the Astros was an all-star caliber pitcher. And they, he was removed to, due to injury after one inning. So Peter Monroe, Kurt Sarlus, Brad Lidge, Ottavio Dotel, and Billy Wagner all came in and held the Yankees hitless. Boom, there you go. You know, um, and of course, the, the, I think the single weirdest one, or the, the one that I have mentioned here, was that Babe Ruth um, got ejected for uh, walking the leadoff man in a game between the Red Sox and the Senators in 1917. And he got ejected one batter in. Uh, the batter he walked was caught stealing after Ernie Shore came in and Shore pitched the rest of the way, a perfect game. So, you know, sometimes those no hitters are fine. And you could have someone like Babe Ruth who gets to be the answer to a trivia question in a combined, in all of the combined no hitters in the history of baseball, which pitcher th retired the fewest number of batters in the combined no-hitter. I brought that up in an earlier and That was Babe Ruth. So, hey, <clears throat> good for the Tigers. This is probably going to be the highlight of the Tigers' season. But good for them for going up against a good team that has the game that has playoff implications and just sort of that psychology of 
trying to catch that final spot heading into the All-Star game. Good for the Tigers and good for Manning, Taylor, and Lynch, Lange for uh, – I'm probably mispronouncing some of their names because it's the first time I've said some of them. But good for them. And with that, the Yankees have moved back into a tie for the last wild card spot. And the player who won the game today is going to be the topic of our second segment of which it's really one of the best free agent acquisitions of recent memory and one where the wrong team made the signing. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. Like everyone, I've had some hard moments over the last few years. The death of my dad, uncertainty with my job, just many things that can make life, let's face it, a little overwhelming. And the pathway to deal with a road that's filled with roadblocks, it's not always that clear. Trying to find that path on your own is not always the right thing to do. Therapy has helped me navigate the waters in life that are sometimes pretty rough. And therapy has helped me articulate my worries, sometimes challenge my preconceptions, and many times it's been helpful just to get my concerns off my chest. If you're thinking about starting therapy, why not give BetterHelp a try? It's entirely online. It's designed for your convenience, and you can work it around your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire and get matched with a licensed therapist. And you can switch therapists at any time at no additional charge. Let therapy be your map with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOnMLB for 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash locked on MLB. <clears throat> I think I coughed right there. Forgive me. Um, Garrett Cole. Let's be honest about Garrett Cole. You know, I've been one to uh, bash the Yankees construction of this team. Uh, I've been one to criticize Brian Cashman. But let's give credit when credit is due. Um, Garrett Cole, who pitched wonderfully, pitched in the eighth inning today against Chicago, coming off a day where the Yankees, you know, very clearly need help in their starting rotation. They got a solid start from Carlos Rodon the other day to make up for the massive disaster, which has been Luis Severino, Luis Severino recently. Say that three times fast. <clears throat> but the Yankees lost when they got shut out by Jameson Tyone, of all people, former Yankee himself. Uh, but Garrett Cole took the ball today, and it was it looked pretty close at the beginning. It was 2-1 to one after 3, but then the Yankees, and led by Giancarlo Stanton, who has you know, not been great this year. I mean, I'm, you can't just focus on batting average. But the fact that his batting average, even with his tremendous day, has been 208. His OPS is only 716. This is not what they need. But he threw, hit two home runs today, raising his total to nine. And he led the offense for the day. Got on base three or four, no, got on base three times. <clears throat> but it's Garrett Cole who's worth bringing up. Um, it wasn't exactly a great stroke of genius or scouting to throw a lot of money at Garrett Cole when he became a free agent after the Astros decided to not use him in game seven of the World Series. And a, in, an event which is still one of the strangest and weirdest managerial decisions I've ever seen in my life. I digress. He was the Cy Young runner-up that year. Arguably could have won. Uh, they gave it to his teammate, Justin Verlander. To me, it was a coin toss year. I'm sure there is some advanced metric who's out there saying, what are you talking about? It had to be Cole or it had to be Verlander. Da, 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 da. He struck out. 326 batters in only 212 and a third innings and led the league in ERA that year for the Houston Astros um, as they got to uh, just a few outs away from winning the World Series. Three, they're basically three innings away from winning the World Series that year. And after that debacle in Game 7 where they used – I think I pitched that game for the Astros, but they would not use Garrett Cole. He became a free agent. And since then – he has played three years. This is his fourth season with the Yankees. First season, the truncated uh, COVID year, finished fourth in the Cy Young vote, 
it's tough to judge anything from that year, but he still had the great strikeout to walk ratio, pitched a lot of innings, um, you know, lost a couple of key games in the in the postseason, but yeah, you know, was was seemed to be as advertised. 2021, I know a lot of people gave him guff for 2021, a year he led the league in victories, but it's tough to point to victories as anything. Um, did lead the league in complete games and finished actually finished second in the Cy Young Award vote. That was a year that people trashed him. They mainly trashed him because he got bombed in the uh, the was it the wild card game against Boston. Although he did win a key game against Toronto down the stretch, which probably put the Yankees in the postseason. Last year, didn't have the best DRA in the world, but he gave them 200 innings. Once again, led the league in strikeouts and. You know, won two key games against the uh, Cleveland Guardians in the division series. Now, he didn't pitch particularly great against the Astros, but he didn't exactly, you know, they, they, that was the game where Boone inexplicably took him out. And, you know, so he's pitched well. He let up way too many homers last year. But this year, Garrett Cole is once again, you know, is putting up a tremendous. Uh, innings pitch total, striking out a bunch. He's winning. He's pitching well enough to win. And can you imagine where the Yankees would be if they didn't have Garrett Cole pitching like an ace? I'll say it. This is one of the best acquisitions the Yankees have made because he's been doing his job. He is pitching like a frontline starter, and that's what they got. And if anyone has any issues with him, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay, not every frontline starter is going to join your team and become what Randy Johnson became with the Arizona Diamondbacks or what Greg Maddox came, became with the Atlanta Braves. I think the Maddox and Randy Johnson are two of the three greatest free agent signings in the history of baseball. The other one, Barry Bonds. I digress. Cole has been a darn good pitcher. And... I remember when he did not sign with the Astros and he went out to the world as a free agent. I thought, you thought, most of us thought, this kid from Newport Beach who uh, went to Orange Lutheran High School in Orange, California, who went to UCLA, California kid, through and did I mention through and there was a franchise that had one player who was forged on Mount Olympus and placed in Anaheim and then went to the far east and took a player who was blessed with great powers and great responsibility as both a pitcher and a hitter and brought him to Anaheim and it became clear that this team could not win without an ace. And Garrett Cole, product of Southern California, all they needed to do was say, how much money will it take? Now, there were rumors that they were offering this and rumors that they were offering that. And somehow, some way, he went to the Yankees. Now, as it stands, he still hasn't pitched in a World Series, but at least he's pitched in the postseason a little bit. And the 2019 Yankees, which were uh, a joy buzzer on uh, Jose Altuve's chest away from going to the World Series, look like they may be locking themselves in to pennant after pennant. And it hasn't worked out, but it hasn't been Cole's fault. I don't care how many home runs he let up to Xander Bogarts in the wild card game. They got into those postseason series partially because of them. And what happened to the Angels, who, by the way, at the time, was landing Joe Madden. Remember how big that was? They no longer had Brad Ausmus as their manager. It was Joe Madden, Joe freaking Madden, who took the Tampa Bay Rays when they were awful to the World Series. He took the Cubs to win a World Series, something that Leo DeRocher and uh, Lou Pinella and all these, uh, Dusty Baker, all these other managers couldn't do it. Joe Madden did it. Now he was going back to the organization where he began as, an, uh, as a lieutenant of Mike Sosha. And he was handed the car keys with Shohei Otani, who was recovering from injury at the time, but still. 
and Mike Trout. And what they needed to do was bring a GD ace onto that team. All they had to do was say, how many dump trucks of money do we have to drop in front of your freaking home? And they didn't do that. I'm sure they offered him a lot. But they just, they should not have allowed him to go anywhere. Whatever it was, they should have kept topping it. Because what did they get instead? They couldn't sign Garrett Cole. So they tried to placate the fans by signing Anthony Rendon, who was coming off of a wonderful season, including a being a World Series hero, where he freaking homered off of the Astros pitchers in the World Series. But what has he been? Oddly, the <laughs> I was gonna it almost the second highest number of plate appearances he's had in the four seasons so far he's had with the Angels was in the COVID year. Played 52 games in the COVID year. He played 58 games the next year. Played 47 last year. And this year, people are talking about him as if he should be designated for assignment. He's got nothing left. And he has, what, four more years where he's being paid forty million, nearly $40 million a year every year. The Angels are still paying for that. Joe Madden's certainly paying for that. If you took a team, that 2021 20, team, let's take them. You had Otani, pitched very well in his 23 games as a pitcher. You had Otani hitting 46 home runs, having an OPS of 365 as a hitter. You put a Garrett Cole on that team, that team that finished with a losing record, granted, but could they have... Could they have snuck up to win 80, to win 89, 90 games? Maybe. I don't know. Neither do you. But the decision to not just hand in the sun, the moon, the stars has come back to bite them in the proverbial buttocks. And here we are. And now we're looking at an Angels team. Now, granted, uh, I, I haven't. Not all the games have been played so far on Saturday when I'm recording this. But the fact of the matter is, there is a distinct possibility that the Angels are going to be going into the All-Star break. Best case scenario. Best case scenario is they go into the All-Star break uh, two games above 500. What's probably going to happen is they'll go in at 500. Seven games out and nominally in the wild card race. And it's probably going to cost them Shohei Otani. Because why the heck would he come back to this team? The Angels have been spiraling, sputtering since Mike Trout got hurt. Why would he go back to this team? He would have if they had signed Cole. And they're still paying for not paying. You know what? The Blue Jays may have been no hit today, but I am predicting that Bo Bichette's bat will be hot on Sunday. And if I were you, I would be making that pick on Sleeper. And if you play Sleeper, you're going to say, hey, I'm betting that it's going to be a four for five day for Bo Bichette tomorrow. He's going to come back like a vengeance against the uh, Detroit Tigers pitching. Now, what is Sleeper, you may ask? Sleeper is a daily fantasy game of chance where you can win 100 times your money. Sleeper is now offering a 100 times payout for up to eight pick contests. Choose as many as eight players that you like. Pick more or less your favorite baseball stats like homers, strikeouts, stolen bases, Get your picks right, and you can win big. Now, look, I got it right here on my phone. See that? Got my sleeper app, and I'm about, and I, you can see all the different players you can pick and make your predictions and make your pick. And I'm going to go right in there and say, Bo Bichette, four hits. Boom. You got safe, fast withdrawals when you win, and I'm going to win. And I'm going to win so much, I am going to buy that house in Hawaii and say, aloha 
from now on. That's what I'm going to do. So use promo code locked on. You'll get up to a $100 match on your first deposit. Terms and conditions do apply. See Sleeper's terms of use for details. Currently operational in 30 states. So check out Sleeper today. It's funny. I went into this year thinking about the Red Sox and thinking, you know what, they they don't have a shot. And I had a couple, like, you know, low-key uh, wishes for the team. I, I wanted them to develop a couple of new players. That's what – the main thing I want, I have a couple of new players I could look at because I said, they're not winning piddly-poo this year. But if I can look up and say, hey, they've got a couple of young players that I can point to and say, all right, in the next couple of years, I could deal with them, I could deal with them, I could deal with them. That's really all I wanted. And I also want Raphael Devers to resign. Um, and you take a look at Brian Bellow has been excellent as a starting pitcher for the team. All right, that's kind of cool. Uh, you know, Josh Wojcikowski has pitched well out of the bullpen. Uh, Tristan Cassis has got a few big hits along the way. Jaron Duran has, you know, p- played very well. Uh, and um, obviously Yoshida has been terrific, and he's not an old guy. And Verdugo has finally found his stroke, and that's pretty cool. And if I looked at that, I said, yeah, all that's true, and all right, they're a last-place team. I kind of expected that, but uh, it's, you know, at least I know going into 2024, a couple of holes have been filled within. And I was kind of – that's how I was sort of taking this whole year. Think, well, you know what? They're not going to do anything this year, but – now, give me a little bit of hope. But I talked about that the other day when I was talking about how one of the things that a baseball team owes its fan base is a sense of, hey, we may not be winning this year, but we got a plan. And when we have that with the Boston Red Sox, I'm thinking, all right, cool. All right, I can I can live with that. I can really live with that. And then I looked at the standings. And the, the Red Sox beat the A's. Um, the game ended a couple hours ago, but I think they hit four more doubles after the game ended. It was just... They basically were playing batting practice with the A's, and they won 10-3. to Whereas my mom would say the final score was a lot to not enough. All right. And I really didn't notice this until a few days ago. There are only two games out of a playoff spot. And the two teams they're chasing right now are two of the most unpredictable teams in the game. The Yankees and the Blue Jays, who sometimes look like pennant winners, and sometimes look like they should all be designated for assignment. And for that matter, the Red Sox are only three games in the loss column and two games in the win column behind the freaking Houston Astros. What? Now, with that, I started thinking things like, should the Red Sox go for it? Then I, I for a little bit, I think, maybe they should trade for Shohei Otani. Maybe that's what they should do. And if they bring in Otani, and that's like bringing in a hitter and a pitcher, and then Otani will see how great it is to be in Boston, and then he re-signs with the Red Sox, and next thing you know, Otani's in Boston. And then I woke up. And here's what I think the Red Sox should do. And I'm going to channel my inner Michael Corleone in Godfather Part 2 here. My offer is this. Nothing. That's what they should do. They should do nothing. Maybe if a team is trying to unload a veteran for virtually no cost, like Lance Lynn, who pitched a brilliant game the other day for the White Sox, and the White Sox should be shoving him in everyone's face and getting whatever they can get back from. If there's a veteran who a team is on the verge of just saying, hey, we're not going to resign him. It's going to cost you, you know, some chowder at legal seafood or something. Fine. But don't touch any of your top prospects. In order to get someone like Otani, you're going to have to trade away Brian Bellow and some of those other players who were basically the you know their their uh, you know, the hopes of the future, you know. So no, don't do that. But also don't like you you're hearing things like should they trade James Paxton? No. Why no? They should not. Do you know why? Because everything positive that's happening with the Red Sox, they're in fifth place sure but they're still having a winning record and they're putting together a nice little yeah, a nice little run 
if this team finishes 82 and 80, I may pop out some champagne because that's so much better than I thought they were going to do. And here's the other thing. Tanner Houck and Corey Kluber and Garrett Whitlock are all injured. Now, Chris Sale, we're, we're not going to see Chris Sale this year. But you're seeing there are a bunch of players who are on the injured list. And if some of them start to come back, if how comes back, if Garrett Whitlock comes back, and not that those are bringing back John Smoltz or Tom Glavin, but they're major league pitchers. And if they come back and Nick Pavetta continues to pitch sort of in this weird long relief role, and if they start continue to get some good uh, starts from – uh, you know, James Paxton, and maybe Joe Jock can figure out what he's doing in the in the bullpen. Who knows? Maybe that would be the equivalent of making an acquisition, making a big trade. This is not a team that was expected to do piddly-poo. And they probably won't do piddly-poo. But, you know, again, if a team is basically handing a veteran, listen, this, okay, we're just not going to resign them. Can you, can you give us an, anything back? Yeah, maybe, but don't make the big trade away or back. Don't trade your prospects away. Bring them up. Pull a Cincinnati Reds and and fill every hole with a young player and see what you got. Maybe there's a couple more good players, but don't trade away James Paxton because you like, it's good to have a, I know this is outlandish to hear, but a major leaguer pitching in your freaking rotation. And maybe, just maybe, if the Blue Jays can't get their act together, if the Yankees can't get their act together, maybe they could leapfrog them. If they are in the wild card series, I, to me, that would be mind boggling. I don't think they're going to be. So treat this as if you found a $20 bill in your old pocket that you haven't, in a jacket you haven't worn since December. This is all a positive thing. Keep the veterans on the team. Unless, of course, someone offers you the sun, the moon, the stars, but they're not going to do that for James Paxton, are they? Stan Pat, this is all bonus time. All bonus time. And uh, I'm just going to give you one of the announcements. I don't know what's going to happen with the show tomorrow. Uh, I have a jam-packed Sunday, and I'm not sure when I'm going to be able to... Uh, record a show tomorrow that's one reason why i'm dropping this one on sunday in case there's not one to drop on monday uh inevitably uh uh miller thomas and i are going to be doing a show uh that it may drop on monday and not uh may drop later on monday rather than monday morning but i am giving you this show to drop on sunday for those of you who don't listen to podcasts on sunday this is your show to drop on monday uh and it's going to be the beginning of the uh the when miller and i get together we're going to talk review some of the stuff that's happened over the weekend, going into the All-Star break, and maybe some of the things about the draft, which will be taking place on Sunday. Hey, um, let's do the trivia question, though, and let's see if someone other than Amy Green and Craig Brindle will get it correct. No hitters. That's the topic of today, isn't it? Five pitchers, five, have thrown a no-hitter in both the American League and the National League. I think some of those may have popped in your head right now. But of the five pitchers to have thrown a no-hitter in the American League and National League, only one is not in the Hall of Fame. Who is the only non-Hall of Famer to throw a no-hitter in the American League and the National League? Name them. And I guarantee you, uh, uh, Craig... Brindle and Amy Green are running to their screen right now because they know the answer. Let's see if someone else knows it too. All right, folks. Well, the new computer, crazy day, dropping a podcast today. This has been Locked On MLB for Sunday, the ninth day of July, 2023. I am your host, Paul Francis Sullivan. Please call me Sully. <laughs>